on the 14th of September 2018, a mix of over 60 senior operational, policy, human resource and financial managers from over 30 non-government organisations involved in delivering more than 250 residential care services in Queensland met at a workshop co-hosted by the Department of Child Safety, Youth and Women and Peak Care. This event will one day become a milestone in the history of residential care services in Queensland. My name is Lindsay Wegener and I'm the Executive Director of Peak Care Queensland. In this video, we present to you some of the highlights of that workshop and I will also answer some of the questions about what transpired on that day. The focus of the workshop was on two interrelated matters. It was about the introduction of a new standard concerning the minimum qualification to be held by residential care workers in Queensland and a linked project about supporting the implementation of the Hope and Healing Framework, a trauma-informed therapeutic framework for residential care in Queensland. That really the introduction of a mandatory qualification for a particular occupational group is up there with what happened in childcare a few years ago. But if you look further back, it also happened in child protection in the late 70s and early 80s when the department itself made a professional qualification mandatory for child care officers in those days. And I was certainly one of the first groups of social workers that uh, became a child care officer in the 1980s. So it was a monumental shift in importance that was placed on statutory child protection work. But going further back to nurses, teachers, other occupational groups where a professional qualification became a mandatory requirement. And these days, I think public expectations would be that, yes, of course, why would you not have a qualified nurse jabbing that needle into you? Um, why would you not have teachers who are qualified to teach in the classroom? Why would you not have uh, people who have the kind of training and education and experience able to do very, very complex work? And I think it's only a matter of time before public expectations will be such that why on earth would we think that people without a qualification could deliver services to some of the most vulnerable young people in our state without proper education and training and qualification. In the long term, I think, whilst that we should sort them pain, I'm sure, in the long term, this will start to become a mindset for people, that they will start to see residential care work as a viable uh, professional career option for themselves, that it will create a springboard into other kind of career opportunities that become available to them as happened in nursing, as happened in teaching, as happened in statutory child protection work, as has happened more recently in early childhood education and care. But mostly what this is really about is about public accountability, about public accountability for the quality of services that are provided to some of the most vulnerable children and young people in this state, public expectations about who will be providing for their care, um, and it will benefit in the long term those people who want to work in this kind of field. But mostly, this is about ensuring that young people themselves receive a high quality service. This in and of itself won't guarantee that, but it certainly will assist in ensuring that those young people get some kind of service that uh, we can be proud of and that they are entitled to receive. Really, the initiative tracks back to two key recommendations of the 2013 Carmody Child Protection Inquiry. Recommendation 8.7, which stated that the then Department of Communities, Child Safety and Disability Services, partner with non-governmental service providers to develop and adopt a trauma-informed therapeutic framework for residential care facilities supported by joint training and professional development initiatives. The second key recommendation was recommendation 10.7. This recommendation stated that the Family and Child Council, now known as the Queensland Family and Child Commission, lead the development of a workforce planning and development strategy 
that should consider a staged approach to the introduction of mandatory minimum qualifications for the non-government sector with particular focus on the residential care workforce. In response to that recommendation, Hope and Healing, a trauma-informed therapeutic framework for residential care was developed in 2015. In 2016, that framework was fully endorsed by the department. Since then, a series of professional development and training strategies commenced being developed to implement the framework. This included conducting an over 1,000 voices survey of residential care workers and conducting a series of two-day workshops throughout the state about what do residential care workers need to know, what knowledge do they need to have, and what skills do they need to possess in order to implement this framework. In response to the learning needs identified by those residential care workers, a series of masterclass workshops were created. These were led by Ian Nussie and Martha Holden, and again conducted in various locations throughout the state to sold out audience. The workshops, as well as the, hope, as well as the over 1,000 voices survey, also informed the development of an e-learning program around the Hope and Healing Framework that I'll talk more about a little later. In response to both recommendations 8.7 and 10.7, initially the Newman-led LNP government accepted the recommendations and subsequently the Palaszczuk government also accepted those recommendations. Since then, the former Child Safety Minister, Shannon Fentiman, has released announcements and correspondence to residential care providers in 2016 and 2017 about the commitment towards the introduction of a minimum mandatory qualification for residential care workers. The commitments made by the former Minister, Shannon Fentiman, have been continued on by the current Minister, Di Farmer, and that's culminated in the release of a minimum qualifications information sheet to all residential care providers that was released by the Department on the 6th of July. During the workshop, opportunity was created for the Department of Child Safety, Youth and Women, to clarify some of the information contained within that information sheet and to answer queries from the workshop participants about the timeframes and the requirements stated within that information sheet. And really what we're trying to achieve is looking at what is the base level of knowledge and skills that people working in residential care actually need. So the minimum qualification standards, the 1st of July 2019 is when we will really start to see um, potentially some changes and that's where there's an expectation that people will hold or be working towards obtaining a recognised relevant qualification um, prior to commencing direct work. So we've tried to be very careful in some of that language um, and making sure that we're providing a little bit more um, flexibility for people. Um, but there's also the expectation that they then um, complete the online hope and healing um, modules prior to commencing unsupervised direct work with children and young people. So for existing staff, um, those employed prior to the 1st of July 2018, the expectation is that they complete the um, online training modules by the 31st of March. Um, and certainly my understanding that is that, that they are on track to be released in the near future. And I'm sure we'll, if Lindsay hasn't already talked about that, we'll hear more about that today. Um, and then that they hold or be working towards relevant qualifications. So what we're trying very hard to do is not be extremely black and white um, with this standard, but to look at what are those things that we need to have in place. When you go through it in detail, you will see that it actually recognises circumstances where, for example, someone might be you know, take an extended period of leave. So what we're trying to do is not say, everyone's got to have it by the 31st of December 2019, as long as there is progress being made, I think is the key message now. That's a very good question. In the lead up to the workshop, a residential care workforce survey was conducted in order to gather more information, more accurate and detailed information about the number of people who make up 
the residential care workforce in Queensland. And importantly, the number and report number and proportion of that workforce who already held or were working towards attaining one of the recognised qualifications. While not all providers of residential care services have yet completed the survey, most have, and the preliminary findings as presented at the workshop indicate that of a workforce comprising around 2,000 members, around two-thirds already hold or are working towards one of those qualifications. This is a testament to the commitment of non-government organisations who have already taken it upon themselves to ensure that their workforce is well trained and is well qualified. It certainly is a strength that we can build on in that two thirds of the workforce already hold one of those qualifications. What the, work, what the workshop also indicated though was that there was a great variation in how well placed non-government organisations are in various areas of the state in implementing this transition to the new standards and that in some areas of the state, there are some, some unique challenges that need to be met. That's what the workshop was about. It was about identifying what those challenges are going to be and identifying what are the best solutions to meeting them. Quite sensibly, we think, the government has linked its response to recommendation 10.7 and 10.8. So in addition to attaining a mandatory qualification, residential care workers will also be required to complete 10 e-learning modules about the open healing framework. Those modules will be freely available to all residential care workers in the state. During the workshop, we were able to inform residential care workers about a requirement to nominate a system coordinator who will work with us in ensuring that all residential care workers are enrolled in the program and those system coordinators will also have access to the program in being able to monitor and maintain records of the progress of their staff through the modules. This information will also be made available to them to assist with their licensing requirements and also to ensure their compliance under HSQF. During the workshop, we were also able to preview the first of 11 podcasts that have already been produced that will be linked to each of the modules. These podcasts feature commentary from members of the expert advisory group that was formed to guide us in the development of the Hope and Healing Framework, as well as experienced residential care workers, as well as, very importantly, young people with a lived experience of residential care. In addition to the e-learning program, workshop participants were also invited to offer up suggestions about topics to be addressed in an extension of the Hope and Healing Masterclass series of workshops. Amongst those suggestions was a very important one, and that was about achieving a better understanding and management of the intersection between child protection, including residential care, and youth justice. As highlighted within the report on youth justice produced by Bob Atkinson, there are far too many young people progressing from the child protection system into the youth justice system. Most residential care providers in Queensland have heard the concerns about the criminalisation of young people in residential care. Irrespective of whether you believe that residential care has, a, has contributed to the criminalisation of those young people, it's very, very clear that residential care has a role to play in halting the trajectory of young people from child protection into the youth justice system. That's what those workshops will be about. It's how residential care providers can rise to the challenge in assisting young people to break that trajectory. One of the first things that residential care providers will notice that in response to one of their suggestions, a workshop will be held to assist organisations and their staff in navigating the vocational employment training system, the VET system. That will be targeted particularly at organisations that are not themselves a recognised training organisation 
or do not have well-established links with recognised training organisations or TAFE. That workshop will be designed to assist them in how to navigate the system, what questions to ask and how to form those relationships with recognised training authorities. That's a very good question. And in oncoming weeks, we hope to talk to residential care workers themselves about this and bring you their stories on video for you to see. What we're interested in is what residential care workers will see as the career opportunities that may open up for them as a result of attaining qualification. We also think there's a very important message to be conveyed to residential care workers that the introduction of a qualification provides recognition to them of the very important and complex role that they play in caring for some of the state's most vulnerable children. We're certainly aware that for some residential care workers who may be required to engage in tertiary study or return to tertiary study after a long period of time, this may be a little daunting. However, we think that non-government organisations and the government have a strong role to play in supporting them in this endeavour. That's another very good question. During the development of the Hope and Healing Framework, focus groups of young people were conducted in partnership with the Craig Foundation. During those focus groups, young people described the attributes that should be held by residential care workers in performing their roles. Very importantly, young people expressed a clear preference for workers who are both well-trained and properly qualified. The decision to introduce a mandatory minimum qualification residential care workers should be seen as providing a very clear message back to those young people that their voices were listened to and heard. And isn't that what this should all be about?